I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. No matter where I go, without a doubt, one of the most common questions I'm asked is not so much a gardening question per se, but how do you control all that wildlife that sees our garden as an all-you-can-eat buffet? So it does pose the question, how do you control all that wildlife? Why is it so hard? And how do you even know it's causing the problem in the first place? It's the million dollar question, how do we manage to have the garden or landscape of our dreams while keeping these creatures from devouring our plants and ruining our yards? and do it in a humane way. Well, experts like Professor Mike Minjak, University of Georgia's wildlife specialist, are busy researching the answers to these very questions, and thanks to them, we learn which solutions work best. Wildlife populations are more abundant than they were years ago, especially wildlife populations that can adapt and, and survive and, and prosper around humans. We've built houses and areas up against forests, we have urban areas, suburban areas that have expanded. Uh, we take those urban and suburban areas and we, we create wildlife habitat. We create plants, we water them, we fertilize them, we create a food source that wildlife responds to. At the turn of the century, deer were a lot less numerous because of habitat changes and wildlife management laws. But today, they're a lot more numerous because of these suburban environments that we've created. The deer have adapted very well and they're a lot more comfortable around humans. Plus, we've knowingly and unknowingly fed them, which leads to a lot of problems not only with deer, but other wildlife as well. My role is to help people find ways to deal with wildlife problems in their backyard, either through research or outreach and education. We try to test products that are on the market. We're not really developing products or inventing things. We're, we're more testing things that are already out there, looking at questions like, do they work, do, do they not work? Under what situations will they work? Uh, what alternative means are, are available? So we come up with other methods to, to, uh, to try to deal with homeowner issues. But our mantra is to, to strike a balance between the needs of wildlife and the needs of people. We both want to be in the backyard, uh, and we don't want to eliminate either people from the habitat or wildlife either. So the bottom line is, try to find some natural solutions that you can apply to your own backyard. First, avoid lethal methods such as poisons, Lots of issues there, including the residual effects to the environment. Nor do you want to be putting poisons into the backyard where maybe you have children or pets. Just as we don't want to be out there poisoning wildlife that are going to have some kind of secondary effect on the songbirds. Instead, try habitat modification. Suppose you have squirrels getting onto your roof. A simple technique of habitat modification would be to trim the branches off the trees so the squirrels can't climb the tree, leap from a branch onto your roof, and then chew holes into your attic. Some other techniques that you can try are scare tactics. Although the results are usually temporary, simple things like a scarecrow or more sophisticated methods like motion-activated water sprays are worth a try. And the same for repellents, chemicals that aren't deadly nor even harmful but still offensive to the animal in smell or taste so they don't eat your plant and they go feed someplace else. And finally, exclusion or barrier methods, which are fences. Of these things, scare tactics, repellents, and physical exclusions or barriers, the only thing that works in all cases are the barriers. And according to Mike, people are always looking for that magic bullet that they can apply over their whole yard to keep all the animals away. And you know what? It just doesn't exist. When it comes to critter control, people have tried countless methods to keep them at bay. But even some of the most popular solutions don't have a great track record in the field. Things that don't work, coyote urine, peeing on your plants, going to the barbershop and getting hair, soap, 
pie pans. Now these things can work occasionally for a little while, especially things like pie pans, which work like a scare tactic, just like a scarecrow. But if you don't move them around, the deer or any animal are gonna become real accustomed to them very, very quickly. Uh, things like human hair, I always tell people, you're in your yard and your dog is in your yard and you're working there all the time, so it's just not logical that you could go to the barbershop, get some hair and stick it in your garden and all of a sudden that's gonna scare deer when they're used to you smelling, to, to your smell around there all the time anyway. So that stuff's just not proven effective. There's no evidence that it works. That we recommend sometimes as a harassment or a scare technique for birds, not so much uh, for rabbits and deer. It really doesn't seem to have a lot of impact on those animals. One common uh, product that's, uh, that's easy to find in, in home and garden centers are these uh, ultrasonic repellers. They're sold for moles, voles, cats, cockroaches. There's no evidence that they have any usefulness at all. They're, they're in my opinion, useless. Uh, a lot of wise tales, a lot of urban legends, but we don't recommend those kind of things that haven't been tested. As far as creating that deer-resistant garden, I'm not so sure we focus on the favorite plants of deer, because depending on the part of the country and how hungry they are, they'll eat just about anything, right? They eat hundreds of species of plants depending on the part of the country, the time of the year, the density of deer. So we focus on what makes a plant resistant then? Resistance comes from a couple of different categories. Physical resistance, like thorns on locust, spines on blackberry, um, the hairs that, that would be, a, say, on like a stinging nettle that would irritate the tongue or the mucous membranes of the deer. Okay. And then the other category would be chemicals, alkaloids, resins, tannins, alkaloids that would be toxic and bitter, resins that, again, just give the plant a foul taste, tannins that interfere with digestion. These would be found in things like um, nightshade, lupines, fiddleheads, those mm -hmm. kind of plants would be deer resistant from those chemicals. Okay, so the question then is, really, is there any such thing as a deer proof plant? Yeah, one that's behind a good strong fence. <laughs> I'm afraid you're gonna say that. <laughs>So let's get right down to the thing that we all want to know. We're at home, mm -hmm. we have a deer problem, and we don't want those deer eating our plants. We've learned already that physical exclusion is pretty much the only surefire way to make sure that's not going to happen. Can be. But we're talking about a fence like this. This is here out at your research property. Right. You've got some sort of orchard growing in the background. Mm -hmm. And it looks like so far so good. No so damage. far it's, it's working pretty well. It looks like it's keeping the deer off there. Uh, they're not eating them, they're not rubbing their antlers on them, they're not tearing them up knocking them over, it's working pretty well. Because the fence is keeping them out. Right. So tell me about some of the details of a fence like this. It doesn't look very complicated at all. A fence like this is not that complicated. It's a, it's a four by four treated lumber post buried a um, couple of feet in the ground, a post hole digger, and put it down in the ground. It doesn't have to be concrete or anything like that. Pack the dirt around it after you dig the hole. You want to go up about, uh, there's probably a 10 foot post, so you have two feet in the ground and you want about seven or eight feet of wire on the fence. And this is not one solid piece of wire, this is two layers right. just overlapping each These other. These are probably two four foot strands, looks like what they've done here on this particular fence. And then stapled right. into the post? And just regular staples driven in with nails, nothing fancy, no fancy equipment in, uh, required. And the posts themselves, they're about how far apart? Looks they're about 10 feet apart. Okay. That's a good size for stability on the fence and the wire. I was looking at this fence earlier. In fact, if you come down here, you can see that it's really taut in the ground, like it's buried. That's critical. You want to either bury it or have it real tight to the ground. You don't want any gaps under it. Deer would rather go under a fence than over it. So any place you have dips in the ground, any, any culverts or any low spots, you want to make sure that the fence is down tight to the ground, even if you have to bury it or stake it down to the ground. Now, they're not diggers, but they'll look for that low They look dip. for that low spot. It's easier for them to get in. It's safer for them to get in. You take a deer going under a fence, there's not much chance of injury. You take that same deer and he leaps a seven or eight foot fence and lands on the other side, there's a high risk that he's going to break a leg, and that's not a good thing for him. Ah. Uh, or you, you're going to have a deer with a broken leg inside your fence. So that's not a good thing. So they don't like to jump. They're capable of it, but they'd rather go under. Now, as effective as these tall fences are for keeping just about any animal out, they're not very practical in a neighborhood setting to say nothing about the aesthetics, especially in the front yard. In fact, most neighborhood covenants and restrictions wouldn't even allow such a fence. Fortunately, new barrier options are being trialed, and the results look promising. So this is the fence you wanted to talk about? This is the other kind of design that we were speaking of. All right, this looks really simple. This is something I could easily do. Tell me about what we're dealing with here. Well, this is a three-strand fence. 
Um, it's sold as livestock protection, but it works very well for deer uh, in our test. It's uh, a post in the ground. This could be, this is a wooden treated lumber post. It could be uh, fiberglass, it could be metal. Um, the insulator is attached to the post. Just simple wire, uh, long spools, very inexpensive. The first strand's 18 inches off the ground. Okay. On the second fence, the bottom wire is 10 inches off the ground. The top wire is 24 inches off the ground. And what's critical is the depth, is about three feet apart. And the reason for that, explain that. Well, deer, we think, don't have very good depth perception. They don't see depth the same way we do. So it forms a visual barrier to, their, to them. They don't understand that they can leap across this. They tend to hop inside and get stuck. And then that scares them and they hop back out. So they don't, they don't uh, see it as something they could cross. They see it as, a, as more of a barrier than it really is, but it, it, it's effective to them. As for the success rate in trials, it's been tested with and without adding electricity. Without it, it's simply a physical but effective barrier. They hit it and a lot of times they'll just turn and go someplace else. In one study, with the electricity, it kept the deer off the soybeans with very little browsing damage compared to unprotected soybeans on the outside. It's not 100% foolproof, but it does the job. And the electricity is really easy to add, even if you're in a remote location, because now there are battery operated or solar power chargers. Well, Mike, I really love this fence. I know a lot of people watching are gonna try to make this at home, including myself. What's really great is the low cost, the simplicity to install it, and then the ability to take it away. And if you want to know more about this fence and the research behind it, well, we're going to have that information on a link on our website at growingagreenerworld.com. You'll find it in the show notes for this episode. The research is really paying off because I think uh, this is the kind of thing that we need to know about. Well, thank you. You know, we could have a lot less wildlife damage in our yards if we were just a little more proactive rather than reactive. But let's face it, most of us don't do anything about it until we have that first sign of damage. Now take comfort in knowing though that no one is exempt and there are some easy ways to solve the mysteries. All right, so you come out in the morning to admire your plants, just that leisurely stroll and uh-oh, you see some damage here. Now, in this case of the hostas, you're gonna ask yourself, well, what caused the problem? Well, I know that this is a deer problem. How do I know that? Because of the jagged torn edges. When a deer bites down on the leaf and pulls it away, they don't have any teeth in their upper jaw. So as they pull it away, it just creates that jagged edge. Rabbits, on the other hand, the other likely source here, well, they do have teeth in their jaws, both upper and lower. So when they make the cut, it's like scissors. It's a clean cut and you don't get this jagged edge. Now, another problem is most of these animals do their browsing at night and you're never gonna see them. So you need to look for clues. Other than this, what else can we find out? Well, we might want to look for tracks, but this is a mulch bed, so you're not going to see any tracks. So I'm going to look for droppings. Rabbits, their droppings are about the size of peas. Deer, on the other hand, more like kidney beans. So that's a good way to check it out. Now, here's another thing. You've got these subterranean animals, and you're never going to see them because they do their damage below ground. Voles, for example, they're going to chomp away at the roots slowly but surely. You're not going to see any above ground damage at all until the plant starts to wilt away. You take a tug on it, it starts to give. You look around, you find that hole, you realize it's a vole. So the key is to learn the biology of the animal. Do they do their damage at night or in the daytime? Do they live above or below ground? Once you learn the biology though, you'll be able to come up with an effective solution. So put your detective hat on, gather up as many clues as you can, and be a Sherlock Holmes in your own garden. So we've learned by now there are a lot of pests that enjoy our gardens as much as we do. But there's one in particular, the squirrel, that's everywhere. Now, it doesn't have a terribly bad reputation for causing a lot of damage, but there's one thing it does really well, and that's digging up all those bulbs we spend all those Saturday afternoons planting, only to discover on Sunday morning they've all been dug up, and that's the squirrel. So here's an easy solution to solving that problem so we can enjoy those bulbs next spring. Get some wire. Now this happens to be chicken wire, but it's called poultry wire and you could use hardware cloth. The key is to make a piece large enough to cover the area that you've planted and that the holes are big enough so that that emerging foliage next spring can get through those holes. But plant your bulbs as you normally would and then put the wire down and hopefully you're using mulch because mulch is good for so many things and if you are, go ahead and cover up the wire with the mulch.
and then anchor it down if you choose. It's that simple. Now in a couple months you want to come and remove the wire. The key is to allow the wire to stay down long enough so those bulbs form the roots. But if you forget and you see the foliage emerging in the spring, that's a good cue to remove it then and you'll be fine. But that's all there is to it. You can walk away and enjoy the fact that you'll have those bulbs blooming in the spring just like you wanted and it's one victory we can claim over those pesky squirrels. When it comes to critter control, two common pests around the home setting, moles and voles. Now, they're found in the same part of your yard, their names are even similar, and they even look alike, but the damage they do is very different. And the way we treat for them is different. They cause a different kind of damage and we treat differently. And you've got some examples for us to look at here. Now, this is the vole, That's right? our vole. Some people call it a, a pine mouse or a field mouse. It's just a short-tailed mouse. Where'd you get these guys? These guys come from the teaching museum at the university's uh, natural history collection. Okay, so short tail, but they have the eyes and they They've have They've got the eyes, feet. eyes and ears, um, their teeth, uh, but they're rodents, so they teeth like a rabbit or a squirrel. Um, they're not strong diggers, so you're gonna find them um, in the in the layer of, of soil um, just under the mulch uh, in the thick thatch of your grass yep. and under the leaf litter they're not going to be deep into the soil digging deep. Now the damage that these guys cause your plant looks intact but it looks like it's dying mm -hmm. and you come up to the base of it you shake it and it's very loose that's because they've eaten away at some of the roots. They've eaten the roots they've stripped the bark off the root collars and the stems down near the soil. The way to treat for those things, if you're not going to use uh, chemicals or lethal control like traps, is use cultural methods. Move the mulch away from the, the base of the plant so that you're creating a physical barrier of bare, open uh, environment that they don't like to cross so that they won't get to the plant in the first place. And that exposes them to predators? Like hawks and owls. Uh huh. And that's your what you call habitat modification? That's habitat modification. Okay. Right. Now compare this to the moles. Well, the moles, again, we said they look very similar, and they do. Um, again, this is from our teaching collection at the museum. The moles have these big, huge feet for digging. Think of them as swimming through the soil uh -huh. and, and tunneling. They're, they're going to be deeper. They're going to be deeper in the soil. They're going to make their own tunnels down in the soil. These guys will use a mole tunnel, but these guys make the tunnels. Okay. These guys are meat eaters. Moles eat meat. These are carnivores. And the meat that they're eating, earthworms and grubs? Earthworms and, and white grubs and beetles, any, any kind of insect or, or insect larvae or earthworms that are going to be in your, your mulch and, and living down in the soil. Now you know that you're going to have a mole issue when you go out to your lawn and you see the mound, mm -hmm. right? right? So how do you deal with this? How do you break the cycle and make these guys go away? Well, there's a couple of cultural methods. Uh, a physical barrier um, in an area around your flower bed. Again, a buried fence might keep them out of the flower bed. That's to not block gonna, them. To block them. That's not going to keep them out of your yard. Uh, in your yard, some cultural methods that have been suggested are uh, castor oil, a spray you could buy at garden centers. Um, Which acts as a repellent. It's a repellent. Um, it's, it's water soluble, it's expensive, and you got to keep reapplying it, but that's a, a condition of most repellents. It's a difficult situation because we want earthworms in our soil. We try to be gardeners to encourage earthworms, but if you're, if you're into using um, grub control, you can do that to get rid of the grubs. If you're not into doing that kind of thing, uh, one suggestion is watering brings the grubs and the earthworms closer to the surface, and they're following the food. So by cutting back on watering, the food will go deeper, and then the predator will go deeper. So you don't get those mounds. You don't get the mounds as visible. But the real issue here is it's a more of a cosmetic damage it than really, anything It else. really is. It's a cosmetic problem. They're really not eating your grass. Now, the mounds are cosmetically unattractive yeah. to your nice lawn. Okay. So if you can develop a little tolerance for imperfection in your lawn, then this is a non-issue. Right. And they're actually good because they're eating a lot of those grubs that come from Japanese beetles and some other things. They're eating some earthworms too, but uh, if you're doing a, a good job on your lawn and organic matter in your soil and your, and your flower bed, you're probably going to have enough earthworms for you and for them to eat. There's enough to share. Well, I hope you learned a lot about controlling wildlife in your own backyard, but I bet you still might have some questions. So until we revisit this topic again soon, you can find out more on our website because we'll have a special link under the show notes for this episode. And the address is the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. You can also watch the videos online and get Chef Nathan's recipes too. 
Thanks for joining us. I'm Joe Lample, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World. Never seen a belt like that, have you? <laughs> it's like, what is that? <laughs> I'm being friendly.